Uh, uh, yeah, 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 uh, Miami, uh, uh, South Beach, bringing the heat, uh, <laughs> can y'all feel that, can y'all feel that, jig it out, uh, here I am in the place where I come let go, in Miami, the base and the sunset low, every day like a Mardi Gras, everybody party all day, no work, all right, all folks. Welcome back to another edition of the Orlando Soccer Show. It is a short episode today because we are recording this at 11.30 at night, right after the U.S. Open Cup game as Orlando City took down Miami United 3-0 out in Hialeah. And, uh, well, Mike Gramajo, who is joining us for <laughs> what seems like it's been about a month, but uh, he's got a crazy schedule, so we're glad we're able to get him on. And not only that, but uh, he's coming to us from Miami. So, uh, Mike, how you doing? What's up, Austin? Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a while, and I think this Miami theme song we had to introduce the show is, uh, I think it's quite fitting to, uh, I guess, get the show rolling. But, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm live here from. Uh, I'm actually right now reporting live from Biscayne Bay Boulevard. I'm not a huge Miami person, uh, so hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. But um, I was just in Hialeah a f- about an hour ago, where we saw Orlando City cruise past Miami United three nil, um, and now they are advancing to the round of sixteen of the U.S. Open Cup, where they're going to play against Atlanta United on June twentieth. Um, is is that for sure, I thought they were doing like a re um, uh, redo of the. Not entirely sure. Um, I know I have seen some reports. Uh, Doug Robertson from um, the Atlanta uh, uh, Journal Constitution uh, tweeted something about that that Orlando's going to play the winner of Charleston Battery and Atlanta United. So I know Atlanta United won earlier this evening. So I'm not sure where it's going to be held at. I think that's what's up to. That's up to discussion but um as far as from what i've seen and the way the bracket is set up too i, I saw it it looks like it's gonna go i think it's more organized than years past where they did a draw um they think they set it up pretty well but regardless orlando city advances to the round of 16 so um obviously it's a an accomplishment especially the season is hasn't been going really too good but <laughs> Um, obviously a win is, it seems like it's been a long time since Orlando city, uh, you know, got a real, a victory. So, yeah, it, it has been quite a while. And this was one of those games where it was set up for them to win. It was harder for them to lose the game to a fourth division NPSL side rather than to beat a team that they should beat even with their second or third string roster. And Jason Christ during the week, he said, we're going to put out a strong lineup. And that's exactly what they did. I think most people heard what Jason said. They said, oh, strong lineup. I guess we're going to play Pierre de Silva and PC. Well, they played PC, but he ended up scoring a goal at the end of it. But this was a very strong lineup from Orlando City. And it was a great opportunity to get some guys some minutes that haven't gotten some recently. They're going to be huge for this road trip coming up, not only in Vancouver this coming weekend, but in Montreal next Wednesday. And so Jonathan Spector being the biggest name i would say the captain getting 45 minutes for the first time in two months huge accomplishment for him coming back from that concussion actually two concussions shall i say kept him out for almost two months and getting him 45 minutes getting him match minutes especially early on when orlando didn't have to worry too much about a lot of miami's attacks there were a few dangerous ones that Orlando held pretty easily, but I think Orlando, for the most part of this game, were on the front foot and played up to the standard that they should have. No, you're you're actually right. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's it, 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 is it really you know it really can't be a much of a surprise, right? Because you're playing against. I think this. I needed to remind myself a lot when I was there at um, Ted Hendricks Park that they're playing a fourth division side, but obviously you look at the first half and you kind of dissect it. There were some moments where, and Jason Christ kind of said it to, kind of alluded to that. And I included it in my recap on OSJSoccer.com where the first half, it seemed like it looked like the same old story. Jason Christ said we, that they were getting a lot of touches in the final third, but just, they just weren't making that right decision, you know, or, or able to kind of qualify, you know, execute on those chances. Um, until the late, the, the, 
the latter part of the first half when Pino got the you know the scoring early, got the scoring in. But in the second half, it was a totally different Orlando City side. They were a lot more dominant. They controlled the ball. There was a lot more passes in the final third. They they executed very well, and they did what they had to do. They they, they two more goals came in the second half, and they put the game away. Um, and of course, we saw some players that normally don't see playing time get some playing time, which is cool because you, you kind of want to get these players some playing time, especially in some competitive minutes. And why not with the Open Cup? Yeah, exactly. And especially for for Specter, if he is going to be healthy enough to play forty five minutes this week then hopefully by the time he gets to montreal he might be able to go for a full 90 uh, especially having trained off to the side for the last week and a half two weeks or so now so that's a huge development for the team amra Tarek is back as well so in terms of center back depth they've got chris Schuler who played the second 45 of this game they've got jonathan specter who's good, good for at least 45 minutes right now and then they've got amra Tarek as well so they've got they went from zero to three center backs in a matter of a few days. So that's huge for the depth of this team, especially on this two-game road trip up in Canada. But I still want to talk a little bit about Tony Rocha because we this is the first show that we've had since really he started playing as a center back. And I think he doesn't get enough credit about what he's been able to do, being that emergency fifth center back, if you will, coming in there, playing a position that he's never played before. And playing really well. He's surprisingly calm on the ball and makes really good decisions when he's pressed high. And I think you can't say that a lot about other center backs, but just that having that midfield mentality in the defense and having a little bit of foot speed as well, I think it, it suits him well. And it's done wonders for, for Orlando, especially considering the circumstances. No, I think you're right about that. Uh, he- I mean, t- Tony Roach is, I think, a very underrated player when it comes to especially that center back role. But, I mean, you, you look at him, he's just a guy who's getting the job done. Is he going to look pretty? I don't I don't think it's going to look all that pretty, especially when you're looking at a player who really isn't a natural center back. But given, you know, how the, the odds are a little bit stacked against Orlando at the moment with the injury bug, I mean, what else are you going to do? It's and, and I think Tony Roach has been just doing a, a, you know, a superb job. I don't want... I don't want to, you know, obviously, you know, give him so much credit because obviously there is a reason why Orlando City hasn't been winning. But he's been doing enough to, I guess, get the job done. Um, today was, I think, was a prime example of that. And, and I think what really helped, and this is going back to Jonathan Spector, is having Jonathan Spector there in, in the back line. Christ said shortly after the game that having Specs back was, you know, very, very good for the team overall because he hurt. He, the, 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 what Specs brings to that back line. Christ said that he, he right away he started communicating with the back line, organizing things. And when you have a, a, a guy like Specs, a, a team captain, kind of organizing the back line and you kind of, in a way, mentoring Tony Rocha during play, during game, game time, I think that kind of benefits Tony at the same time because he kind of gets a, 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 a he, he grasps a little bit of what, uh, you know, what it means to be a center back. Um, and obviously, we saw it today. I mean, Miami and I really didn't pose a, a threat at all. I mean, there was probably one shot at goal, and Earl Edwards Jr. saved it pretty well. Um, but, you know, I, th- I think, yeah, Tony, Tony Rocha definitely, for what Orlando City's been going through with, with, it, with its backline issues, uh, Tony's been definitely holding it down uh, thus far. Yeah, and I think with, with Spectre especially, I think a lot of what he brings to the table is that leadership capability. That's why he's the captain. Uh, and being able to direct the back line, depending on whoever's whoever's playing there, uh, he's able to just step right into it and be that leader that Orlando City really need. And I think for the last four games especially, having so much turmoil within the back line, having so much change and not having a significant leader stepping up and being able to direct guys that haven't played those positions often enough i think that's going to be a big help for orlando going forward into not only just this road trip if he if he does end up playing but i think the rest of the season if he can stay healthy enough and that's going to be huge for orlando because there was a lot of questions of if he would even be ready to go the rest of the season because and we've said this on multiple occasions on this show concussions can be a really weird animal because they can last for a week they can last for a year you really just don't know 
So it's good that Spectre was out there. He was heading balls. He didn't look like he had any discomfort. And so that's a really good sign for Orlando going forward now. And I think before we kind of move on from Jonathan Spectre, I did ask him about whether how close does he feel feel um, in, in in regards to being fully match fit. And he said he he's close to it. He's, he didn't really want to give a percentage. He didn't really want to kind of give a straight answer because, as, as you just mentioned, Austin, it's, when it comes to those type of injuries, you really can't, you know, you really can't kind of say and an, an, you can't really give an end result at the end of the day. This is something that you have to be really, really, really cautious about. Jason said stated the same thing when he was asked about specs. And he said, you know, you have to be a little bit nervous when you're playing a guy like that. But um, moving forward, they're, they're going to obviously – they're gonna still going to keep an eye on specs because you really can't rush these type of injuries. He saw 45 minutes today. Does that mean he will see more minutes this weekend? Probably not. I, that's my hunch. Um, obviously, you've seen Lamine Sané. Um, he wasn't in the final game day roster, but he did make the trip. Every, everybody made the trip to, to Miami, but he was there watching from the stands. Um, but, you know, you have Emerald Tarek back now um, as well. So if I wouldn't be surprised if Spex does not play on this, this Saturday at Vancouver, perhaps see a, a, a Tarek-Rocha uh, pairing, who knows. But um, at least you have somewhat of a, a you know, a guy like Emerald Tarek who, who's proven he's who's proved himself to be a pretty good center back for the Lions this season. So um, obviously, yeah, the, the the whole the big question mark for the back line still continues, especially for the center back pairings. But to have Specs back is somewhat of a a, a silver lining in this a little bit of this a little Orlando City slump in MLS right now. So let's go take a look back and and just kind of go through the game in general so orlando city didn't score until the 37th minute great buildup of play in that first goal with yosue coleman and question combining in the midfield question getting a few feet of space finding rj allen on the wing he one times across into the box and pinier just slots it right into the bottom corner it's a great buildup of play and it's something that you know it, it seems so simple uh, the 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 build up the the finish it's just like well why couldn't they have done this before it felt that simple of a goal but sometimes you just need to see one go in the back of the net and the floodgates can open you saw a little bit of that in the second half where they completely dominated the game uh, having a go- one goal lead for this team can be <laughs> really good because they don't do that very often this season Mohamed El Manir in the 53rd minute found question running down the left wing. He crosses it, centers it off into the middle of the 18. And Dylan Powers, who hasn't really played much at all this season, he steps in and blasts one into the uh, top left corner for his first goal in an Orlando City uniform. So that's another great sign for Orlando and their depth is just getting guys some minutes. And in this game, it was Dylan Powers who stepped up and he scored a goal. And he's uh, he, he's one of those guys where he's been a goal scorer before. Back when he was in Colorado, he was a tremendous goal scorer in his rookie season. He just kind of dropped off and then lost a lot of playing time in the process. So it's good to see him getting on the score sheet for the first time in, in a while. So maybe he can become a, a possibility when it comes to uh, attacking pieces in the future. In this game, he was kind of playing a more defensive role. But either way, good to see him get on the board. And then the third goal. That was just another example of of Orlando City capitalizing on some silly uh, Miami mistakes. And there were a few options, a few times during this game where Miami almost gifted Orlando a few goals. Uh, And those were early on chances that Orlando wasn't able to finish. But this one they were. Cluston jumps on it after Pino forces the turnover. He centers it off for PC, who blasts one. That was it, 3-0 the final question an assist on all three goals secondary assist on the pino goal and then a direct assist on the last two so a, an incredible game from sasha question and one that you you would hope to see from your playmaker especially since he's also been in a bit of a slump as well i think and i, and I have a fun fact to go with that question i know austin you love fun facts i do so th- this fun fact is coming from rafa cabrera uh, orlando city communications manager um, so yeah, regarding Sasha question, he had a, a three assist game. Obviously they count secondary assists. So he had a three assist game, but 
his three assist game, his obviously his first three assist game for Orlando City. The last person to have a three assist game for Orlando City was none other than Ricardo Kaká on September twenty fifth, twenty fifteenth against the Red Bulls. So um, a little bit of history there. Um, Sasha Kleshin in the in the record books. I guess uh, Sean Rollinson kind of tucked that somewhere in his uh, encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's it's funny that. Kaká gets the three assist game against Sasha Kleshin, and then Sasha Kleshin does it for Orlando uh, for only the second time in their MLS careers. So good to see Sasha kind of getting out of his slump and being able to facilitate. Again, it, you love all of these positives that came with this game, but you take it with a grain of salt because it is a fourth division team. The competition isn't as good as something you're going to be seeing on Saturday night. With Vancouver, they didn't have to play a cup match because they're not in the U.S. So they're going to be a bit well-rested compared to Orlando, who played 7 out of 11 starters. So that's going to take a, into effect a little bit. and you, you got to wonder if they can take that momentum of beating a team like Miami United and run it into MLS play. Because the way I see it, a win is a win, and it helps with momentum, but you got to think of the other factors that come into this as well. Of course. So another thing for Orlando City, outside of Jonathan Spector getting some minutes, Earl Edwards Jr. getting his first minutes of the season. His last time he played for Orlando City was in Philadelphia at the last game of the season last year, and we don't even need to go into how that went, but he's got a great record with the Orlando City and U.S. Open Cup play. 2015 and 2016 are the only two years that he ended up playing U.S. Open Cup matches, in which both of them he won. 2015, he won in a penalty shootout against the Charleston Battery. 2016, won nothing against the Jacksonville Armada. So he is now 3-0-0 in Orlando City U.S. Open Cup play. And he really didn't have to do much tonight. But either way, good to see him out there and getting some some minutes because last year he was getting all of them for OCB. So, you know, I think Earl is... He's a player that's been technically a day one player in, in regards to the MLS Orlando City team, and he continues to show why he's really a a goalkeeper that not necessarily is developing. I think he's already developed. To be honest with you, I mean, you look at OCB last year; he was phenomenal. Um, and I don't know. Obviously, yeah, obviously Joe Bendick is a starting goalkeeper, but you know. You, you you know how you usually feel when a, a backup goalkeeper usually gets in goal, and you kind of there's fans that usually feel a little nervous. I think when when you have Earl Edwards as a starting goalkeeper, or when you see Earl Edwards start a game, you really don't have those nerves because you know he he's gonna put in a shift, and um and he's just a player that a, a goalkeeper that you know I guess he has a better now a better understanding. Um, of how this league works, how um, how he expects his back line to work. So, yeah, big big ups for, for Earl uh, uh, for tonight as well. Yeah, and, and the, the thing about Earl that I think people, a lot of people forget, actually, was that he was second team all USL last year, and he didn't play the full season. He he was one of the league, league leaders in shutouts, in saves. I mean, he was all over the place last year with USL. People, I think, just remember him by either that 2015 U.S. Open Cup game in Charleston or the Philadelphia game, because those are the only two times really that they've seen him with the first team. So I think he gets kind of a bit of a bad rap, but honestly, I think he's he, he deserves a look in the future. Joe Bendick is still out and out the starting keeper for this team, but depending if they if they keep Earl around, I could see him usurping that spot in the next few years. I think he's he's definitely proven it over his time in the minor leagues. It's just with the goalkeeping position, all you need is an opportunity. Just a few nights ago against Chicago, Patrick McLean, who's been a career backup, he's never really played an MLS game. Uh, he got his first opportunity, or second opportunity really, against Orlando and came up huge, made huge saves, and gave his team a 2-1 win by making some huge saves at the uh, end of the second half. So, unfortunately for him, he's now going to be out for six to eight weeks with a hamstring tear or something. So, that's unlucky. But the overarching point I'm trying to make is all you need is one opportunity and to capitalize on it to make your statement. So, you you have a lot of quality goalkeepers in this league that just don't get those chances. 
So I think Earl's kind of one of those guys that if it's not here, it might be somewhere else, but he is a good goalkeeper. So is there anything else for you being there at the stadium that stood out to you from this, from this game? Well, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that kind of stood out to me was um, the Miami Colts soccer culture that that exists here in South Florida. Uh, I, I, I consider myself a, a Central Florida homer. I was born in New York, but moved to, to Central Florida in 2004 and lived in Central Florida, you know, till, till this day. So obviously from, obviously from what I hear from about Miami, obviously you hear about Beckham and MLS, but then you also hear about Miami FC with the NASL. And then today, today we saw Miami United, but besides the fact that there was a, a huge amount of traveling supporters, the home, the home crowd was pretty, pretty phenomenal for obviously the, the stadium it being, it's not that big, but it was a pretty good crowd out there. And, um, I asked Jason Christ what what you know what you know what what is or what is his thoughts about Miami and and Jason didn't really hold back he he said you know he's been to Miami several times and he said that I quote you would have to think that the team is going to do very well here I would have to think the culture here was supporting an MLS team very well unquote so um that kind of says it you know that, that kind of says what Miami really is about um and I think it's a little bit of underrated when you kind of when you kind of ask yourself, is Miami really capable of having a major league soccer team in the near future? And I think it is because soccer is growing in in this country and including Miami. But I think under the right ownership, um, I think a major league soccer team will succeed. And we're seeing it now with David Beckham, uh, the Moss brothers, um, and Marcelo Clark. It's just a matter of time, but. I think that's one thing that stuck out to me, you know, uh, the, the soccer culture is very well alive here in Miami and it's great. It's great. It's great. Um, hopefully a rivalry can kind of naturally, uh, be born. Yeah. I, I think having a, a team like this four hours away, kind of like what Tampa Bay was to Orlando in the minor leagues, it can only help with the the growth of the league and, and the rivalry a little bit. Cause I know, I know the fans love to travel, especially with some of the, the closer places that they're able to go. So how was it? Let me ask you this. Uh, how was it for the fourth division team and, and knowing that there's going to be a bigger team eventually in Miami, because the way that I've, I've understood it is that Miami United kind of wants to create their own niche in soccer in Miami but then when the big team comes in, that will probably take over and, and kill off a lot of what Miami United is trying to do. If you think about it, it's kind of comparable to what happened with the Atlanta Silverbacks. When Atlanta United came in, the Silverbacks died. And that was like one of the, the smaller kind of close-knit communities of, of soccer in Atlanta. But because the bigger and better MLS team came in, it pretty much killed all that off. So I'm kind of curious what what the opinion was of maybe some of the fans, if you talked to any and what your thoughts are on that. I, I mean, honestly, I really didn't talk to any fans. I, 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 I'll be quite honest, but you know, from what the people I spoke with, just Miami people, not really Miami soccer fans, but Miami people that know soccer, um, I'll, I'll include some family members. I think when I, as soon as I got here, they asked me about, so what's going on with major league soccer, Mike? And I'm like, uh, you live in Miami, you don't know what's going on with your own major league soccer team that's trying to find its footing here in Miami. But it, look, we'll, we'll put it like this, and I think that was a really good example you said with the Silverbacks and Atlanta United. At the end of the day, you know, obviously, major league soccer gets criticized a lot for not having prom promotion relegation, for having playoffs, for having such a American, you know, type of style league, right? But that's that that's just the way it is and it's, I don't think it's really going to change anytime soon that's I think that's the American soccer culture and major league soccer's kind of help grow that and, and foster it with what happened with the silverbacks that's unfortunate but you 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 look at it the silverbacks were averaging what almost at bash probably five six thousand I don't I'm not entirely sure but silverbacks are the their, their soccer stadium um wasn't a big stadium and 
from my days when I covered the NASL in, in, in 2013 for SBI soccer, I didn't see a huge fan turnout at, um, at Silverbacks Park at all. Um, and it was because just American soccer fans, not just Atlanta soccer fans, American soccer fans. If it ain't a major league soccer team, if it, it's not, if it's not, let me correct myself. If it's not a major league team, they're not going to support it. It's the same way with Orlando City. When they were in the USL, they were averaging what close to eight thousand, probably ten thousand fans a game. That was yeah, and that was in the early days, and then they steadily grew. I think twenty thirteen, obviously, they peaked with the twenty. But eleven, almost eleven thousand, yeah. if, if I'm being nice. But they were not hitting those twenty thousand numbers they, they're hitting at Orlando City Stadium. Uh, or we can say the 30,000 when they were playing at the Citrus Bowl in their first year in MLS. And it's because they weren't a major league team yet. As soon as they had that major league pretty much t- uh, you know, tagline, it's official. And it's the same way with Atlanta. And I think what's going on in Miami, I think it's going gonna, it's, it, it's gonna to go the same route, unfortunately. Um, obviously, when Beckham finally has a as an official team name and they announce where they're going to play. Obviously reports say that they might play temporarily at Hard Rock Live before their soccer specific stadium gets built. But as soon as Beckham finally gets his first team going, um, maybe in two years or so, I, I mean I, I, I just the way it I, I envision it to be, Miami United's not going to be there for very long. Maybe they'll be there as an MPSL side still, but I mean, you really can't compete when you have a a team with the major, you know, the major league tagline at the end of the day. But that's good at the end of the day too, if you think about it, because when you have a major league, a major league team in your city, in your market, it just kind of helps the city out economically, and 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 it grows the sport as well. And um, obviously, this is you know we're we're years to come until that happens, but. The soccer culture is alive here, um, but unfortunately, with the way American sports is set up, I think it's going to take a, you know a major league team to kind of build or to 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 grow tremendously the Miami soccer base here. Um, that's my opinion. I, that's what I get when I talk to regular everyday citizens here in Miami. But um, obviously, time will tell um, if Miami and I can find a way where they can kind of work alongside Beckham. But um, until then, obviously, we're, we're right now. Um, Miami United put on a good showing today, and um, obviously, this is just the beginning of a bright future for Miami soccer. I have no idea of, of, of Miami soccer culture. I haven't been down there for years. I think the last time I was there for, was for a Chicago Cubs game because Cubs fans outdraw Marlins fans every time. But I've never really seen soccer down there, and a lot of people kind of like to tease that sports in general just don't work in Miami because fans are so fickle. And the fact that it didn't work before kind of makes people a little wary, but soccer in the South in general, you know, people were wary of Orlando, see how that went. People were a little wary of Atlanta, see how that went. So you keep going farther down South, you, you got to say, well, this is the time for soccer in the South now. So having three teams, Atlanta, Orlando, and Miami within a few hours of each other, that can only help grow the game south here in general. So I'm looking forward to it whenever Beckham and his folks can actually get their shit together. <laughs> that's that's going to be the big thing. But yeah, so like I said, this is going to be a short show. We kind of just wanted to talk about the U.S. Open Cup game and preview a little bit of what's going to happen in Vancouver. Mike, like you said, the entire team is traveling together they chartered a flight to go out of miami to head to vancouver and is what is actually the longest road trip ever in mls from miami to vancouver it's the most distance traveled ever in mls so that's going to be a huge huge fun for this orlando city team but luckily they have their chartered flight they can stretch out they can rehab they can move around they don't have to worry about bumping into people on a regular commercial flight they can just do whatever they want to do. So that's a huge thing for them going into this game now. And hopefully they can be rested and ready to go by Saturday. Absolutely. So with that, let me get your prediction really quickly for Saturday. What do you think? I mean, if Orlando has a full strength team, if they can manage to 
if they can manage to finish their chances against a Vancouver side that, to be honest with you, uh, it's not been their greatest season so far. Um, they they have they have racked up their fair share of L's, a lot of draws. <laughs> Um, but it's on the road, and Orlando City has shown that they can play pretty go- good on the road. They have a couple road wins already in the season. They almost got a road win at Toronto, but um, that, you know, just a late collapse kind of saw them lose a the game. But if Orlando City can has a full strength squad and they can finish their chances, I think they can come out with a positive result, either a draw or a win. I don't see them losing if. If they're able to finish their chances and have a decent full strength squad, I am the type of person that doesn't talk negative. Exactly. So if Dom Dwyer is there, Lamine Sane is there, or one of them, uh, or Scott Sutter. So I'm going to go with or, not and, 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 but or. If one of those catalyst players, those difference makers are there, um, I think we, we, the, the, there will be a good result for Orlando. But obviously, Orlando's Achilles heel has been exactly that, not being able to finish, and then a collapse in the back line. So if they can fix those errors um, against a Vancouver side, um, I think Orlando is has the ingredients to crank out a positive result. So I'm going to go with a draw or a win. Um, if <laughs> they manage to do what I kind of just said. So uh, I, I, I need, I need like an actual result though. And you can't just say one or the other. You got to go, you got to go in. Best case scenario for fans, a draw. They may not like it, but I mean, a point on the road is, is you, I, I'd rather take a point on the road than a loss. So I'm going to go with a draw. They haven't drawn very many games this year. It's only the first game against DC. That's it. They haven't, but I think Jose, uh, Jose Aja, if he gets to start, <laughs> may want to prove, or something against his former side, and if Breck Shea. Oh, yeah, don't forget about Breck, Breck Shea. Shea. A backline of Jose Aha and Breck Shea could be fun to play against. Hmm. So, um, yeah. Shout out to uh, Harrison Heath for having his baby with uh, his wife, Kaylin Kyle. He, <laughs> he, I Adrian can't. Heath is now a grandpa. He well, his is uh, I think his older or younger son. Mm-hmm. I think oh, yeah, so he's, yeah, already he's already a grandpa. He's a grandpa again. Well, but... congratulations to uh, Adrian Heath for. His uh, other, his new um, grandchild. Yeah, I, 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 I love the reaction that he gave when, um, when Orlando was playing Minnesota in the preseason, and our good friend Victor Tan asked uh, Adrian, "What's it going to be like to be a, a grandpa again?" He just turns to Victor and just says, "Yep," and just kind of walks away <laughs> laughing. That was it. He was just like, "Yep." I, I it, it was funny because the way that Victor qu- asked the question, he's like. Uh, so you know your son Harrison marrying Kaylin Kyle and now having a grand uh, another grandkid. How do you feel about that? He's just like, yep, and he walks away, and that was it. <laughs> Not sure if that's a slide on Kaylin or, or or any you know you Maybe you can you can, you can you can read into it as much as you want, really. Maybe but, he just doesn't want to comment on his uh, on family stuff, you know. Yeah, or his son marrying a former Pride player, or or any of the oars. Uh, it's just kind of a a funny circumstance. Did you know that? Uh, Kaylin Kyle shut down all her social media. By the way, I uh, did not know that. Um, I have a po- probably I, probably because she blocked you. <laughs> I I doubt it because I, I I just have a policy. I usually unfollow former players. Nah, but she probably still blocked you. She literally blocked like anyone that she ever followed. I don't think she ever followed me though. Oh uh, well, <laughs> Kaylin Kyle. Well, I think I found her. Kaylin Kyle. This account's tweets are protected. Okay, yeah, she locked her account. Oh, there you go. Mm, that's weird. Yeah, well, she she was tired of people like giving her shit on social media, so she's just like quitting social media. Well, congratulations to them, anyways. You know, a new credit, yeah. and you know, a new baby's <laughs> in the horizon, and the Heath family just keeps being bigger. I honestly completely forgot what we were talking about now. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, Vancouver. Um, I think Orlando City is going to draw. I think that. Jose Aja is probably going to have a decent game against his forward team trying to show them up. And unfortunately, it, Orlando's going to be able to score, but not enough. Uh, you know, Vancouver's team is actually really good offensively. And I think they're not as good defensively. But considering that Orlando City's 
been able to score lately, that might be their downfall in this game. <laughs> Unless Don Dwyer comes back. I, 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 I think I, I like the I think what Jonathan Spector said um, shortly after regarding that Vancouver trip, but then obviously going to Montreal. This, this is you know this road trip in general. He said that um, these next games are going to be a catalyst to the season. So I think he's absolutely right. I mean, obviously, and this is obviously what Spectre said, every team goes through a bad stretch of games. We went through our six-game winning streak, and now we're in a little bit of a losing rut. But every team goes through it. Um, it's just how the, you know, how the type of character you show when you're going through it, that you can turn things around. The team, he's confident the team can turn things around. But in order to turn things around, you have to show – a willing effort as much as Jason Christ says that a lot, a willing effort. Um, that's all it's going to take. Um, and, and that willing effort from what I see from my point of view is being able to finish those chances because they out Orlando city. I don't, I mean, I don't have a tally count, but they have had a, a, a huge amount of chances. They weren't able to bury. Um, so they just need to do that. Justin Miriam needs to get going. Sasha question had a really good game today. Three assists. If he can kind of, produce that or replicate that um game in game out consistently along with jose coleman i think i don't think we really touched on him obviously we're kind of closing the show now but uh jose coleman played pretty well today a lot of one to the sasha question and kind of helps set up that first goal with pino so you know a collective effort that's what it's really going to take a full collective effort it's gonna it's gonna probably help Orlando City turn things around. Um, obviously, they're still above the red line, but you want to be above the red line, and you have to prove it. Um, Vancouver's gonna be a huge test, and um, yeah, it's gonna be a huge test. And um, obviously, a lot of fans are hoping they can turn things around. Very true, indeed. And it was interesting that with Coman on the wing this time, rather than being up top, how he played kind of combined with Question and kind of opened up the offense a little bit more. So. Maybe we see that in in Vancouver. Maybe Jason Kreis wants to switch it up a little bit after what he saw, and you never know. We'll have, we'll have to see. Yeah, I think that'll, that'll do it for this show. Kind of a shorter one. But uh, this weekend, going to be a, a fun one. Not only is the Orlando-Vancouver game going on, but we're going to be recording a special World Cup episode. That'll probably drop either Sunday or Monday, depending on when we record it. So look out for that. We'll have everybody hopefully joining us this time which is a very rare occasion these days because everybody's got their busy schedules but we're gonna try and make it work for this world cup show coming up and especially with the world cup coming up next week that's going to be tons and tons of fun uh for all soccer fans so looking forward to that especially yeah with that i think we'll we'll end it thanks mike for joining me all the way from miami hopefully we'll see you this weekend uh, for the world cup show yeah, it's been a minute, but um, I'm happy to be back. Um, hopefully, uh, the, our listeners today get, had a really good um, – enjoyed the show today. Uh, and we're obviously going to try to continue this um, consist- on a consistent basis. And obviously, once the team is back um, at home, we're going to continue our, our post-game shows on Periscope and Facebook. So keep an eye out on that as well. Yep, exactly right. And with that, that's going to be it for this uh, show. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll be on Spectrum Sports 360 this Sunday at 1040. You can tune in as I talk a little bit about Orlando City and a few other things. So uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. From the Tower of Power, too sweet to be sour, I'm funky like a monkey. Sky's the limit and space is the place.